So good morning, everyone. I believe we are live. You can hear the church bell ringing. It rings five minutes before mass. So I hope everyone's day is beginning well, and I'm very grateful that we have this opportunity within the context or the reality of the COVID-19 crisis to be able to, uh, for me to offer mass um, for you, uh, for you to be able to uh, spiritually unite yourself to Jesus in the mass on this day. As I've mentioned often, and I'll probably keep mentioning it again because I'm getting old and I repeat things as older people tend to do, but I just continually cannot sort of in a way get over the fact that we have this technology that allows us to do these wonderful things today. And so um, it's always something to give thanks to, to God for. I just want to mention two things before we begin Mass. And hopefully it helps you not only to understand something about the symbolism um, that we have, uh, a lot of symbolism in the church helps you to connect with something in your faith, but also uh, this day, as I mentioned before, each day can be set aside for a theme or a person, or in some cases an object, to help us grow in our faith, to sanctify our day. So for uh, today, what I want to focus on, as you'll see, Catholics were familiar with the uh, crucifixes and the images being shrouded. So why do we do this? Well, this goes back, it's an ancient custom in the church. This originated in Rome, where the, in ancient times, the images in the papal chapel were shrouded. Uh, and the gospel from, the, from St. John was read, chapter eight, verse 59. It would close with that verse. And uh, the gospel states, Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why did he do this? Because his time had not yet come. So he didn't do this out of a fear or lack of courage, but it wasn't the Father's will that he be captured at that moment. It was in Gethsemane. So we shroud the, uh, the crucifixes and the statues two weeks before uh, the celebration of Easter. And it's also a way for us it's a time for us to uh, kind of, an ex uh, the church expresses her shame as we put our Savior through his passion and death. So it's a time for us to reflect uh, within the presence of God on our own weaknesses, our sinfulness, and realize that all of these things, corporately speaking, as a human race, from Adam to the last person, all contributed in some way to Jesus having to come into the world and die for us. Now, this normally would perhaps be a discouraging or depressing thought, but not when it comes to Jesus. Perhaps it uh, cultivates a sorrow within us, but it's a sorrow that leads unto joy because with Christ, he's here to save us. So that's important to remember uh, is the, why we do the shrouding of the statues and the crucifix. And the other thing is, uh, what, is this, what can this day be uh, reserved for? Or what is it reserved for in the custom of the church? What it's reserved for is the Blessed Trinity, the other days, as I mentioned, uh, you know, like Tuesday is the guardian angels and our divine filiation, but Sunday is the Blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So one way you can try to keep this day, there are many, I'll just offer one. Uh, one day you can try to keep this day within this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Blessed Trinity, is to divide the day up into three parts, from morning till noon, noon till, let's say, supper or dinner, and then dinner till you go to bed. So the, the, mo the morning can be devoted to the Father. Try to reflect on the Father's love. Uh, and even the couple of times in Scripture when the Father graced us with uh, speaking. So that can be the Father. And always the Father says, I am pleased with my Son, listen to Him. So the Father uh, and the Father's love for us. And the second is Jesus, our Savior, so we can reflect on him and how much he loved us. God so loved the world, he gave his only son, so that all who believe in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. So we devote our day to uh, the afternoon part to Jesus. And then the end part from maybe dinner or supper till we go to bed, the Holy Spirit, he's the sanctifier. He's the one who helps us to be holy. Uh, he knows what we're like, you know, uh, we're but we want to be saints in the making. Uh, so <clears throat> he's the one sent by the Father and the Son to help us make it to heaven, to sanctify us, to, in a way, chisel away at us uh, from a spiritual point of view so that we can grow, even profit from our faults, learn from our mistakes, and continue on our journey to eternal life. So the morning, the Father, and the afternoon, the Son, 
and the evening, the Holy Spirit. It's a great way to sanctify our day. And so with that, Mass will begin. Now, just so because I'm so imperfect, I will probably be distracted. If anything comes up on the screen, I'm going to put this little piece of paper. Uh, it's not going to block out uh, the eye of the computer, but it's going to help me uh, <clears throat> not be distracted. So I hope everybody has a, a truly blessed day. I know it's difficult for a lot of people, um, you know, during these times of the coronavirus, but we need to have as, as much structure and discipline in our day. The Navy SEALs teach us that discipline equals freedom. Whatever that means for you, really try to have some structure, uh, to have a schedule in your days and try to follow that. And it helps us, uh, especially during these times, it helps us always, but especially during these times. God bless you. and pray teach us with thee to mourn our sins and close by thee to stay as thou with Satan did content and didst the victory win O oh, give us strength in thee to fight in thee to conquer sin. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. By your help, we beseech you, Lord our God, may we walk eagerly in the same charity with which, out of love for the world, your Son handed himself over to death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring, and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I, will place you, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
With the Lord there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. With the Lord there is steadfast love and great, and great power to redeem. If you, O Lord, should mark our iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. With the Lord there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning. With the Lord there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. With the Lord there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if, the, but if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever believes in me will never die. Praise to you, word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now a certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the people there were just now trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of the world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, will live. And anyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When he had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go, to, and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus began again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said to them, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to, him, to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, as you can well imagine, there's a lot going on <clears throat> in these readings, in the gospel certainly, but the readings in general. So these last three Sundays have taken us on something of a spiritual journey. And that journey, in that journey, we first discovered three, now three weeks ago, three Sundays ago, the first we are thirsty, I remember the woman at the well, and always trying to satisfy our thirst with something tantamount to salt water which means or symbolizes the pleasures of this world in inordinate ways. Because there's nothing wrong with enjoying the good, legitimate things of this world. God has created them. But we try to make them ends unto themselves, as it were. And when we do this, we only become more thirsty. Augustine uh, manifested this when he, you know, went for everything that the world could offer. And he realized, you know, Lord, you have made us for yourself and will always be restless until we rest in you. Second, we are blind, the blind man of last week. And while we think we see with our physical eyes, we are blind to what really matters, to the course or path of life that we should really be taking. And we are blind to Jesus and who he really is. 
even if we know it intellectually, because presumably I'm talking to the quote unquote choir, to uh, Catholics, Christians, uh, believers, who knows, maybe somebody's watching or interested, doesn't believe, but you know, the Christians, we know Jesus is God, <clears throat> but we know also we don't always act like he is. We don't always believe in his power. So today in some ways, the most serious realization of all is that we discover we have undergone a death. And I know this sounds really depressing, <clears throat> doesn't it? Um, but we need to wait for the end credits here. You know, like some of these movies that right after the very end, they, sh they go through the credits. Some of these Marvel movies, DC movies perhaps, DC comics, um, at the end, they go through all the credits and that's kind of like um, many people leave because they're not interested in the credits. But many, you know, that sort of is somewhat, uh, can be maybe albeit weak um, or stretching it a bit, but still it can be like the resurrection. Uh, and but there's even the um, at the very end of some of these new movies now they show little clips of the next movie that's going to happen, and if the end credits are not sufficient to be kind of uh, you know pointing to something like the resurrection, the the little clips of the next movie are so we can focus on the negatives of life like the Good Friday, and if we don't look any further, that's it. It's depressing. It's horrifying death. Life is you know suffering this valley of tears. But if we wait for Easter Sunday, God, we realize, wasn't finished on Good Friday. Uh, and even after Easter Sunday, there's still an epilogue being written in the Book of Life, and that's the season of Pentecost or the second coming of Christ. This doesn't, you know, uh, completely wipe away the difficulties we have, makes us blind and somehow oblivious to them, it helps us to navigate through them, though, and to see that now there can, when we unite these things to Christ, they can take on a value they never had before. So we are also hearing in this the good news that comes from God, <clears throat> but we realize it's not a, a cotton candy type of good news, but real solid and challenging good news. And we'll hear again and again that this now has to come to us or we have to, it has to be appropriated to us by way of the cross. And that's what many of us, of course, find so difficult. It goes against the grain, it's repugnant, but this is our salvation. So the first and second readings can be approached in a number of ways. But I want to focus on the Lord calling the dead out of their graves. Dead and all that leads to death is a part of our very living now. <clears throat> when Ezekiel first spoke this, he was dealing with a people who had become so discouraged because of their sins and the consequences they were experiencing as a result of those sins. So when you hear the prophecy about the, the spirit being breathed over the bones and the bones being reassembled in the flesh and so on, for those people in that time, this was meant to be something that would give them hope, that new life would come to them, that they, would, they should not succumb to discouragement, to despair, that their nation was going to disappear. God would revive them. They needed to repent, though. Uh, this is something that God always says to his children, I'm with you. But you got to repent. You got to take. You got to own what you've done, and you've got to learn from it. And you got to, you know, offer contrition and then start again. Start again. Start again. <clears throat> but for us, looking back on this prophecy, we realize it's not just about a piece of geography, the promised land, but it's the ultimate promised land of eternal life. That when we become discouraged and perhaps we're tempted to give up, God reminds us, no. No, don't give up. I'm with you. All right? So you, you, but you've got to own what you've done. You can't just, you know, toss it away and say, oh, it doesn't matter, and so on and so on. So that's Ezekiel. St. Paul deals <clears throat> with this reality from another angle by reminding us about the war that goes on within our very selves. He quotes from Romans chapter 8, verses 8, and he says, And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, what does this mean? Well, to cut to the chase, Basically, we live by or go by the way of our fallen nature. It doesn't mean that human nature or human flesh is rotten or corrupted, but it has been severely harmed or wounded by sin. Something is out of whack. And we know this, if we're honest about it, because we know that many times we should do something, we just don't do it. Uh, that, and, and sometimes we don't want to do it. And all those conflicts that are within us, so, you know, we can pick and choose from any of the seven capital sins, gluttony, lust, sloth, 
anger, envy, and so on. You finish the list. Our inclinations, our tendencies are no longer harmonized with reason, which you know is supposed to seek our true good. They're no longer harmonized with reason and no longer infused by God's grace uh, in a natural kind of way, you know, like it was before original sin. And so we are all over the place at times. We're intemperate, up and down. We are good, and then we become selfish. We're productive, and then we're lazy. We experience moments of interior harmony, and it's so wonderful. And then the storms of irascible and concupiscible appetites just boom in on us. You know, irascible meaning the anger within us. We go too far in responding to injustices. We're indignant about certain things and we just blast people. We save up things and store them up rather than deal with them at, you know, deal with them at letter A. We wait till they're at letter P and then boom, the volcano goes off. And then concupiscence, you know, inordinate desires for pleasure. We eat, <laughs> we eat too much. Or we, you know, um, or we, we're just seeking a life of comfort. Uh, and this will not probably help us get closer to heaven because Jesus said, unless you follow me and pick up your cross or pick up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> Finally, the above culminates in death. Now, believe it or not, this is not meant to discourage you. Uh, this is what I contend, if you know those who know me, know, you know, probably what I'm, the kind of, uh, stream of thought, you know, that I'm going to convey here. Uh, there's just too much lying going on today or too many opportunities to knock us off course, to distract us. Uh, this is the enemy who wants us to live in a frenetic pace, distracted, off course, so that uh, we head towards the cliff of eternity totally unprepared. And it's not about not enjoying life. Please don't make that conclusion, you know, from what I'm saying. It's not about being so, so disciplined that you're kind of like, you know, um, if you pull back, a, if you have a bow and an arrow, if you have the bow and you pull back the string and you're living your life like that string that's held in a position that's taut all the time, T-A-U-T, eventually you're going to break because uh, we can't be, uh, it's, it's one thing to be intense. It's okay at times to be intense, but we can't be tense all the time. Uh, we shouldn't be tense ever, really. We're trying not to be. So, but if we're like that, eventually we're, we're just going to fall apart. We're going to crack. We're going to just crumble. No, we need to be somewhat intense or focused, but we also need to enjoy the legitimate things. We need good recreation, recreation. Even trying to find it within these abnormal times in which we live so that the abnormal doesn't become abnormal for us on a regular basis, that we discover how we can cultivate a normalcy within an abnormal situation. That is a challenge for all of us. So <clears throat> we need to listen to Jesus in the Gospel of St. John as he's the only one who can really lift us from our discouragement, going back to Ezekiel, align our passions with reason and God's will, going to St. Paul, and spiritually and literally raise us from the dead. Jesus is not just a religious teacher. He's not just some wise man or any prophet like other prophets. First of all, if he was just another prophet, he would be a really bad one because he hears of his friend being sick and he says, let's stay here. Huh? He lets Lazarus die. In fact, he knows Lazarus is going to die and he lets him die. Now further, he does not go shortly after his death, but it's four days. Four days. Now, why four? Because the Jewish people held the, the rabbinic teaching was that they had this idea the soul stayed in the body for about three days. So after th the third day, there was no possibility of somehow a revivification or a reanimation or any of that kind of stuff. But the soul was gone. Or the spiritual part of the person was gone. So the body was corrupted. So after three days, uh, that was it. So that was the, the, the three days our Lord waits to the fourth day. So Lazarus was decomposing in the tomb, according to what everybody thought. If Jesus had been able to simply revive him, as many of the people in the gospel I just read, they said, well, he, uh, see how he loved him. Others said, well, if he had come here sooner, he could have prevented him from dying. Uh, this is not good enough for our Lord. 
it's, I mean, obviously that's the job of, of doctors and uh, today in medicine and so on. But our Lord wants to show us something far greater, superior, and higher. He wants to show us a supernatural reality that most of us think can't happen. It goes contrary to the senses, and that's the resurrection. Jesus goes four days later so that everyone will be absolutely certain that Lazarus is dead and decomposing. Jesus wants to do something. He will do something that no human person can do and no angel can do either. Jesus asks Mary, where have you laid him? This is reminiscent of God calling out to Adam, where are you? God goes in search of his children. He knows where Adam is, but Adam doesn't know where God is. He's hiding from God. But God goes in search of his children. God gets a bad rap on this matter, and many others as well. We tend to point the finger at him. Adam and Eve hide, and now Lazarus is hidden in a tomb, which represents what happens when we sin and are cut off from God. God doesn't cut us off. Rather, we cut ourselves off from God. Again, God gets a bad rap here. We think that God doesn't love us. He can't stop loving us, and that's why he keeps coming after us. He can't stop you know, wanting the absolute very best for us. He won't, but all too frequently, we won't take responsibilities for our own actions, that they have consequences. And much of a sort of a spirit in the world is that you, know, you can do whatever you want as long as you don't break the law. Even some of the laws, I won't get into that, now is not the time. But even some of the laws, they have grave consequences, not only in the natural, but the supernatural order. But this idea, you know, that you can do things and not really suffer the consequences is absolutely disastrous for us. And many people are succumbing to this. They're buying into this. Why? Because it appears to be the easier way. <clears throat> and God is trying to teach us that this just won't work. It won't even work now because eventually this will bite us. So we're always pointing the finger. Adam points the finger after the sin and God comes in search of him. Why did you do this? He says, well, it's the woman you put me with. So he blames his wife and he blames God. I always, you know, I've said this many times from the pulpit here at Corpus Christi. If I get to heaven, God willing, one of the questions I would like to remember to ask is what would have happened if Adam had said, I sinned. Lord, I, what I did was wrong. I'm truly sorry for this. I'm not trying to set up the straw man and, and say that I would have done any better than Adam did. But I just wonder what would have happened. But anyways, we know, this, we know what did happen. We can benefit, hopefully, from our own episodes you know, of what Adam didn't do and what we can do. And so it shows that God does love us. He, he did not have to do this, but he did. <clears throat> this was unheard of in any pantheon. You know, the, the Greek and the Roman pantheons were the so-called gods of the ancient world Loving human beings? Never. Never. And, you know, sometimes there's this idea that we should go back to a pre-Christian era. Yeah, go back to it in the history books and see the people lived in constant fear. I mean, a terrorized kind of fear, always trying to appease the gods. Our fear is different, the fear of the Lord. There's many different kinds of fear, but the fear of the Lord is something that is rooted in love. That we love God so much that we don't want to offend him. We should never live in fear as children of God, even when we do something wrong or sinful. God loves us and goes in search of us. Jesus loves his friend. And while he lets him die, he reminds us that sin has consequences. And whether we like to admit it or not, we are going to suffer those consequences. That's why you and I will one day undergo physical death. And why we have a hard time, sometimes just trying to do good or forgiving somebody who has done something wrong to us, whether it's small or something really huge. But he never abandons Lazarus, and he doesn't abandon us. Jesus comes to the tomb and he cries out. Now, if you've ever watched the first of the Narnia movies, which if you haven't, I really recommend you try and get a hold of them, you might remember that Aslan, who is the lion, represents Jesus. Lewis's representation of Jesus, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Huh? So this is, this is our savior. He really roars at some point and it's almost deafening. Well, it shows his power. Jesus cries out and he shows us that his word is not descriptive. 
It's not descriptive. We describe things that really are and already exist. But Jesus's words are creative. They create. Jesus both brings reality into existence and he can give life back to the dead, the spiritually dead and the physical dead. This is the power and property belonging only to God. This should give us hope. Should actually truly astound us, amaze us. It should like, it's a, one of those eye popping things. <clears throat> but it's meant to help us have confidence in him that even though we have sometimes profound weaknesses, uh, his power is far greater than any of the weaknesses we have. Hopefully now you begin to see why Jesus waited to let Lazarus die. He does not want us to make the fatal error uh, of thinking that he's a wise man or just another teacher or a great religious figure who founded some world religions. Sometimes I hear this, Jesus is, is a founder of a world religion. It's, it's partly true, but it's not the whole truth. Jesus made it very clear, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Why? Because he's not a human person. Gandhi was, Muhammad was, Buddha was. They're human persons. Jesus is not a human person. Now, I understand this is only understood or accessed by faith. Cannot be reasoned to. Uh, reason comes to a point where it understands Jesus is doing things far beyond the capacity of a human individual. But to actually say, and when we say the words, because we, an atheist could say the words, but to believe them, that is a result of faith. It's the gift of faith. Jesus is telling us the good news in the midst of our discouragement, Ezekiel, our disordered self with our unruly passions, Romans, and our spiritual death and the physical death that will eventually follow, St. John. These have been dealt with by God. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, John 1.14. And what I think are the most powerful words in the whole of scripture, perhaps they go unnoticed, but we need to sometimes stop and drink them in, let them sort of seep into our system, down, get into the very marrow of our spiritual bones. When St. John says, reflecting back on what has occurred in his life, that which, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which we was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So St. John is expressing here the deepest hope and desire of every person. It was incomprehensible to the Jews, to the children of Israel, that they could not only see God, but they could touch him and hear him. And this, yeah, this is what happens in the person of Christ, that the power of God, that they were terrified to encounter. Remember when Moses went up the mountain and came down, they said, you do this for us, we'll stay back. Moses, you go, we'll, we'll just, you, you communicate to us, you be the mediator. God said they've chosen well, because the people were still very, very imperfect. But Moses was, his will was aligned with God's will. So uh, St. John says, we've been able to reach out and touch God himself in the flesh. It's words fall short. <clears throat> words fall short. What, what, what can one say? So he's expressing the deepest hope and, of, and desire of every person. We saw and touched God. This is, even while we're still in this valley of tears, not only good news, but the absolute best news we could ever hear. I know I have to stop because you're probably saying, oh, he's going on so long. This is Father Hamilton. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> Can't deny that. But sometimes it's just, you know, good news that you don't want to stop. So today, whether you are having a good or a great or maybe not so great a day, and I realize a lot of people are really, really struggling. I mean, I can only imagine. We hear it on the news. People are not used to being cooped up in their homes for a long time. If you're an introvert, this may not be so difficult. But even then, introverts, if they're smart enough, they realize they can't be like living in a cave all the time. We need each other. That's why we have to try even harder in these days to pray for each other and to be spiritually united with each other. See how I go on and on and on? So, but G uh, Jesus, by his creative word, not just descriptive word, but his creative word can bring you back to life, restore your hope, satisfy your thirst, and help you to see what is really important in life. God bless you.
Okay, we'll pray the Nicene Creed, so in, in your homes, why not stand? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of he maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God the Father wants all mankind to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth, and now we place some of our prayers and petitions before him. For the church, that God will transform our fears into hope, selfishness into love, and deaths into new life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our spiritual leaders, that they may be agents of the Holy Spirit in bringing back to life those groups and institutions that have been plagued with divisions and hatred. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those with a terminal illness, that they may surrender their life into God's embrace and come to know Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For strength and courage, that God will inspire and strengthen all who are searching for treatments for the coronavirus, coronavirus or working to develop a vaccine for it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our healthcare workers all over the world who are giving so much of themselves, sacrificing themselves, and going well beyond the ordinary to serve those who are sick from the coronavirus, that God will strengthen them, lift them up, and help them to continue persevering in the good works that they are doing. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for those who have died, that they may reach up the perfection that comes through faith in Christ, especially those of our parish and for all the living parishioners, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let us now just offer in a few moments of silence our personal prayers and petitions. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you placing some of the needs that we have, those that we have spoken out loud and those that are deepest in our hearts. We ask that you grant in fact what we offer you in faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth, the mark of human hands, who will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the earth, 
and the fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual dream. Blessed be God forever. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all this holy church. Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify them by the working of this sacrifice through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit lift up your hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right and just it is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks Lord Holy Father Almighty and eternal God through Christ our Lord for as a true man he wept for Lazarus his friend and as eternal God raised him from the tomb just as taking pity on the human race, he leads us by sacred mysteries to new life. Through him the host of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petitions through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Michael, our Bishop, and all those who hold into the truth and on the Catholic and Apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you the sacrifice of praise that they offer for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glories of our Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers and all things, we may be defended by your protecting help through Christ our Lord. Amen. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, order our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those who have chosen through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his Almighty Father, Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you.
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, if we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts you have given us this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kind of countenance, and to accept them as ones who are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, to command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel, to your altar on high and the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, life, and peace, through Christ our Lord. Amen. To us also, your servants of those sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will to live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and with your spirit. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Communion Antiphon, everyone who lives and believes in me will not die forever, says the Lord. Now we'll offer a spiritual communion together. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot, at this moment, receive you sacramentally, come at last spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. I wish, my Lord, to receive you with the purity, humility, and devotion with which your Most Holy Mother received you with the spirit and fervor of the saints. Let us pray. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ in whose body and blood we have, com we have communion, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Bless, O Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy, and grant them what at your promptings they desire they may receive by your generous gift through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God. St. Michael prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Just before I begin the uh, final two verses, the two verses of the uh, recessional same hymn, Lord, throughout these 40 days, I would ask that you uh, kindly go to the Corpus Christi Parish uh, website, and you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, um, I don't know what you call it, a tab, I guess, that um, and with the possibility of donations, because the churches still have to continue, quote-unquote, business, whatever you can. 
uh, perfectly consider whatever you can within the midst of your present circumstances. And I'd encourage if other member, members of other parishes are watching, please support your own parish. You can certainly uh, support this one too, but primarily it's your own parish. They, they need it as well. Everybody's uh, you know, going to be struggling. So uh, kindly remember as much as you can, Corpus Christi, not only in your prayers, but in your donations as well. So Lord, who throughout these 40 days, as thou didst hunger, bear, and thirst, so teach us, gracious Lord, to die to self and chiefly live by thy most holy word. And through these days of penitence, and through thy passion hide, Yea, evermore in life and death, Jesus with us abide.